Language is the basis for human consciousness. It's what turned us from primitive hunter-gatherers to sophisticated beings. It's kind of amazing that we associate so much power with verbal, communicated symbols. This kind of linguistic phenomena has been the basis of my independent study research topic. I've written a rather lengthy essay in this class that I've titled The Effect of Political Structures on Languages of Their Domain, and also have created a lengthy survey for my peers to gather some useful data for my research. And to be honest, I'd rather utilize some nifty visual aids instead of a lengthy video essay just to make this video more entertaining entertaining and to showcase my personal style. Be warned, my data is from middle schoolers. So to better introduce and condense this rather complex topic, let's take a look at this map of Africa. Isn't it just so linguistically diverse? There's actually about 2,500 languages spoken on the African continent, give or take a few hundred for regional dialects. No big deal, it's just the most ethno-linguistically diverse continent on Earth. The general situation in regards to indigenous African language families is that of a dialect continuum. To explain for those of you who don't know, if a villager wanted to relay a message to someone in a neighboring village, let's call this first villager Villager A, they would be able to have a mutual conversation with a villager from the next village over. Let's call this next villager Villager B. If villager B needed to relay the message to the next village, he would just have the same ease of communication with villager C, who is in the third village, compared to villager A. While on the other hand, because of the greater geographic separation between villages A and C, it would be more difficult for villager A or C to communicate with each other rather than A or C communicating with villager B. So essentially, when geographic separation increases, mutual intelligibility between spoken language decreases. While most heavily demonstrated in Africa, this linguistic phenomena is common in language families all around the world. But I digress. Jinkies! Looks like I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself. Anyway... Let's take another look at this map. Wow, Africa. You've got, like, thousands of indigenous languages and ethnic groups. Oh, but wow! Looks like colonial powers decided to cut up African territory like a cake. Thanks, Spain, Italy, France, Britain, Germany, Portugal, and Belgium. One phenomenon, which is true of practically all countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, is the subordinate status of African languages in relation to the imported European languages. The root of this problem can be traced mainly to colonial language policies. Coupled with low status and esteem is the low development status of many African languages. Indices of language development status include whether the language has been reduced to writing and has a viable orthography, whether there are descriptions in forms of dictionaries and grammars, whether there is substantial literature in the language, and to what extent the language is used in. That was a rather lengthy introduction, but the main idea of this video is a visual exploration of the effects of different forms of language planning enforced by different governments. And in addition, I want to show how different power structures and political ideologies can influence languages and what those effects indicate about society. No matter how geographically separated two countries may be, if they share political structures in common, there are bound to be linguistic traits that both languages share as well. And on that note, Let's talk about communism. Before the communist revolution and the short-lived Russian Republic, Russia was a hereditary monarchy. And, like many other domains ruled by monarchies, there is always that linguistic rule of honorific codes when addressing the elite class, but... Don't worry, we'll get into that later. The communist revolution actually introduced new vocabulary to the Russian language as a means to replace more archaic vernacular that had been previously used. Another runoff effect of communist language planning shows a suppression of regional Russian dialects, especially observed when native Russians talk to foreigners even today. From this linguistic phenomena observed in modern Russian, we can see that dialectal suppression indicates a connection to centralist communist ideology of suppressing individualism and forced social equality. Suppression of individuality is a strong component here given the communist obsession with centralist assimilation and prioritizing economic and military servitude over capitalistic entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial desire. There's a definite similarity between Russian and Chinese as far as how the languages have evolved due to communist language planning. Since around World War II, China has been enforcing a form of standard Chinese known insert audio clip of someone saying what you. In fact, the standard Chinese linguistic policy contains communist nuances resemblant of the USSR's attempts of language reform. The first main component of the language policy was to standardize the pronunciation of the language. Chinese is a logographic language, meaning that each word has its own individual symbol. The benefit of this is that written Chinese is comprehensible to any person who can understand the written language, but the political agenda enforced within the standard Chinese policy suppresses regional dialects, which seems to be a theme of not just communist language planning, 
but centralist language ideologies in general. Two was to incite a nationalistic movement that will spread standard Chinese across the country, which seems pretty centralist, and I wonder how they will be able to deal with that. Three was to introduce annotated written Chinese characters in an effort to facilitate literacy across the country. So for any like regular person out there, this is basically where we get the simplified Chinese and the traditional Chinese on Google Translate. Anyways, I digress. The USSR actually did this to their language reform for the same reason, just with a bit more centralism and abbreviations to militaristic vocabulary. The fifth and final part of the plan was to ensure that standard Chinese be enforced in classroom environment. This is not a direct correlation to the USSR's language plan, but this fifth principle in actuality extends to all public services in mainland China. This component of standard Chinese policy had a great effect on Taiwan, as although written Chinese and Taiwanese are practically identical to each other, spoken Taiwanese is very different than spoken Chinese. You could say it's a far removed dialect of Chinese, and it's even more different when compared to a constructed, more formalized language like Guoyu. The intent of implementing a standardized language in nations is not always a bad idea, but when governmental bodies don't represent the people that they rule, a standardized language created by a misrepresentative government is bound to face backlash, and in the case of post-World War II Taiwan, the standardized language was a major source for conflict to the native Taiwanese people. The undemocratic language planning and execution of Guo Yu was a big contribution to ethnic tensions that arose between pre-war nationals and post-war immigrants in Taiwan after World War II. Overall, the backfiring of standard Chinese in Taiwan presents a case of cultural turmoil that I think can be avoided in the future by accounting for cultural differences of others when enforcing a national language policy. <coughs> or perhaps voting on even enforcing a national language at all through a democratic process. Let's talk about feudalism. The main linguistic phenomena I want to present that's present... <laughs> yeah. Anyways, the main linguistic idea that I want to present is in regards to honorifics. What places on earth are known for feudal societies? Oh, alright, cool. Lit. <laughs> Lit. Japanese is notorious for being so ingrained in context and honorifics for the language to facilitate communication. Also, people may know of Europe for being notorious for dialect continuums, but Japan and feudal Europe, to some extent, both share common traits of formality and honorifics and dialect continuums. Let's take a trip through the time machine. Hope you like that time machine graphic, my dude. During the Edo period, the feudal class divisions really took a toll on the linguistic situation in Japan. There was also a lack of communication between people from different regions of Japan, which can somewhat be attributed to the breakdown of Japanese kingdoms. If I may read an excerpt from the academic journal Sociolinguistics in Japanese Content. Even though this sort of communication barrier caused problems for the traveling expectors of the feudal era, they pose no problem for the average farmer simply because they never went outside of their own feudal state domain. By the time the 1800s rolled around, there was a push for a common language, or koine. However, people of the upper class in Japan believed that a standard Japanese language should be derived from Japanese literature, which, mind you, was only available to the elite class. The common people wanted standard Japanese to be formed through a democratic voting process, taking into account the different dialects of spoken Japanese. Of course, the obvious solution to this linguistic pickle would be to improve social services and to promote regional travel, but instead what actually happened was a split that occurred within Japanese in which two forms of spoken Japanese emerged, elegant speech and commoner speech. Perhaps it's inappropriate that I say they emerged as a result of the linguistic pickle, but the importance of formality within the language increased. The concept of formal and informal speech actually commonly occurs in languages with feudal roots all over the world. While Latin doesn't have any feudal ties to the Roman Empire, there were two forms of Latin spoken in the Roman Empire, which perhaps is linked to a similar social construct to feudalism. What I'd rather take a look at is Spanish, which is derived from Latin. While not as intertwined in honorific code as Japanese, modern Spanish provides enough of a glimpse into feudal Spanish through its use of verb conjugations. There are two types of verb conjugations for the singular second person forms of verbs that depend on whether the person you are referring to is depicted formally or informally. For example, if I was talking to someone held in high regard, I would say something like, Usted come manzanas, which word for word means, you, formal version, eat apples. 
The verb conjugation in this example is the same form you would use when talking in the third person, as in using he, she, or someone the third person, obviously. The informal conjugation is exclusive to its informal second person singular form. When thinking about the previous example, we can see how a formal person is essentially referred to in the third person, even when you're talking directly to them. Hmm, in what feudal society does this remind you of as an American viewer? One of the questions in my survey was about feudal honorifics, and if I may read one of the responses. Haha, you got pranked, I'm not actually gonna read it, just pause the video if you want to read the question and answer. Bing bong, bing, bing bing, bing, bing bong. Being, yeah. This small detail in the Spanish language reveals the psychology of a commoner within a feudal society, indicating a mindset that since a commoner is so beneath a person of the upper class, then perhaps they must address such a person in a manner if it were as though the lower class person wasn't physically present in the conversation, showing the failure of feudal societies in language planning. Feudal society provokes a division of social classes. And finally, let's talk about ACE. Indonesia is the fourth most populous nation in the world, with an estimated population of nearly 250 million people. It consists of over 13,000 islands stretching along the equator between Southeast Asia and Australia. There are a significant number of distinct ethnic groups speaking an estimated 600 regional languages. As a colonized nation, Indonesia didn't have much going for it as far as a national linguistic policy, given the challenges it would have overcoming colonial rule and its geographic challenges because it is a very vast archipelago. I could go into the history of the Indonesian language and its relation to Malay and Dutch, but the key point of Indonesia's linguistic success is planning a language that takes the nation's diversity into account. At the time of Indonesia's independence, Bahasa Indonesia was only spoken by about 5% of the population, while Javanese was spoken by about 40% of the population. FYI, Bahasa Indonesia is Indonesia's official language at the moment. Choosing Javanese as the official language would have shown favoritism to the nation's largest ethnic group, undermining the nationalistic ideology that citizens across the nation withheld. Bahasa Indonesia, a form of Malay, had already been spoken throughout the archipelago for centuries, one of the key elements to the success of the Indonesian language policy. This principle demonstrated in Indonesian sociolinguistics shows that the standardization of a language must account for the diversity of the nation's people and aligned with the political agenda of people as well. Also, Bahasa Indonesia is generally used as a second language, as native regional languages still dominate Indonesia. However, that's what makes Bahasa Indonesia so practical. Its use as a lingua franca instead of a government-enforced centralized language demonstrates the democratic ideology of embracing diversity through the use of a regional first language, while still being proud of a national heritage through the use of a democratically decided second language. This language planning ideology needs to be appreciated more, especially in America where most people tend to speak only one language, even though the people who took my survey tried to love themselves just a little bit too much and said that most Americans were bilingual. English is only our de facto language in America, so perhaps it's a bit problematic to enforce it as if it is a national language. This use of English enforcement as a political weapon undermines America's ethno-linguistic diversity. Given my points presented on language planning done right, perhaps as Americans we can analyze American sociolinguistics to see what they reveal about America's current political climate and appreciate languages for all they do for the human functioning. Other than just helping us like, say things.